Great, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone joining. If you are joining on this nice hot evening. <laughs> so I am going to share my screen with you now. Thank you so much for joining on this Friday evening. Um, what I'm gonna do with this talk is I'm going to, my artist, my perspective as an, as an artist. So I'm gonna be talking through the process of how I make my work. And I'm also going to be talking through you know, some of the key projects that I've done. Sometimes I'm going to talk for longer on some projects than others. It's not that there's more emphasis or not. It's just that it's quite, you know, I like there to be a bit of a rhythm. <laughs> so here is one of the leading images that we were advertising this talk with, which is one of the series that I'm going to be talking about. And this evening, I'm actually here in South London. So I'm in Croydon in South London in my studio which is wonderful because I haven't been back in my studio for five months and this is the first week. Maybe I can just show you around actually. So here, this is like my archive behind me. Each of these little, I work in projects. So each of these boxes are projects. I've got my negatives above here. So I shoot on analog film. And then I've kind of got this space here, my tea station, very important there. <laughs> my library and books that I'm in. And then the top up here, I've got my print storage. So I have, um, you know, I exhibit a lot and I'm gonna be talking about exhibiting specifically quite a bit and showing you some of the images um, like install shots and et cetera, because that's such a big part of my process. And I think what's nice is that you have a range of speakers that are talking on this platform. So it's nice that I'm specific about my position and my context. So, I'm going to be showing you through essentially a bit of a chronological order of my work. And, you know, my work really is drawn from autobiographical narratives. So essentially personal work, which means that I, I draw from my life. I draw from things that kind of annoy me or things that I notice and they end up becoming projects. They end up becoming photographic series. And I've got more experimental with photography as I've gone on within my career. Um, so I'm gonna end, you know, I'm gonna show you throughout this talk, this kind of journey that I've been on within photography. And I imagine, you know, people coming to this, you know, the London Institute of Photography, you're on a journey as well with your own photography. And I'm gonna be showing you the journey that I've gone on. And this is very much, you know, an early series, an early image of mine, which was called The Other Woman. And I had a relationship with a married man. And I started to think about this idea of the other woman. You know, it's such an interesting word, the other woman. And there's not really a word for the married man, a man that has affairs with women. You know, it's called a married man, but the woman is called, you know, the mistress, the bunny boiler, the home wrecker, the other woman. There's so many terms around that. And I decided that I wanted to meet up with women that were other women and find out their stories. Um, so this was a, you know, a series, this is actually my own image. I added my image into the series. <clears throat> um, and from that initial series, which was really kind of, it was actually a, a graduate piece that I did when I was finishing in my third year at university. And I, it was very interesting how I decided to do a piece of work that looked at private detectives. And I was really interested in the fact that, you know, a private investigator, essentially the photograph that they find or capture could kind of change the dynamic of a family. And I went through this investigation and I realized that actually it was my own story I wanted to tell. The fact that I had seen a married man for five years. And in that time, I couldn't take any images because the images, would become evidence. And it was very interesting to have that relationship for that long and not have any images of it. And it's something that really played on my mind, but at the same time, you know, this married man really changed the course of my life. He supported me to go to university. He helped me with the flat. He really took me out of this South London, you know, rave scene and said like, you love art, go and study and really supported me to do that where my family wasn't particularly, you know, wasn't academically inclined or, you know, I'm, I'm quite, it, it took me on a different course. But, you know, it's very weird when someone becomes involved in your life because you start to think 
Am I being who I'm meant to be? Am I being, am I, am I where I'm meant to be? And all of these thoughts came up when I started to study my MA. So I got into the Royal College of Art and I felt quite out of place, to be honest, to be there. Um, to be doing an MA. None of my family even did a BA. So there I was doing an MA. It felt very weird. I felt it was quite a competitive environment. But when I was there, I started to play with this idea of the married man and this idea of like repeating something, this idea of playing with this position that I was in. And this was what was the, the starting point for the project Married Man. And my work is really research-based, so I never know what the final images will be like. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this tonight where I slowly develop the image. You know, if you're working commercially, you, you would obviously, you know, you do a mood board, you do tests, you'd go and do the shoot, or you might do an editorial where you only have 15 minutes to shoot a portrait. Like, oh my gosh, it has to be perfect. <laughs> but within the artistic process, I will slowly, slowly, slowly shape a project. And my project takes me, you know, often a year to do or 18 months to do. And the Married Man series took me 18 months to do, slowly uncovering and slowly developing. And, you know, I knew I, knew I wanted to do something about this position of the married man. I knew I wanted to kind of cathartically look at and critically look at what this relationship was. You know, a man 25 years older than me, a man that was keeping me a secret kind of... And at the same time, I found this website and I found it listed in a trashy magazine in a dentist. And it was somebody talking about the affair that they were having. And the woman at the bottom said, you know, how much she loved it. She never had to wash the socks. She never had to tidy up. She just got the best bits. And she was like, this is how I want to live my life. And at the bottom in a little, you know, one of those little box out informations, it said, you know, you can be a mistress too. And this was a website. And the website was called reconnect.com. And I saw this whilst I was thinking about my role and the married man. And I was like, my God, there's websites. And this was kind of like pre-Tinder. So there was this website that was, you know, your affair is our business. And I was like, this is so weird. You know, this really gave me a question to the work. And the question being, you know, how is the internet changing relationships? The fact that you can then log on to a website and you can conduct an affair. And I just found that really interesting kind of as I was thinking about this. So what I did was I signed up. I signed up as a mistress and started to kind of think about this kind of performative role. At this point, it wasn't even a body of work. And so with those, initially I saw like four different men and they didn't know that I was shooting a project. They didn't know that I was an artist. I had a fake name, a fake number. And I just kind of wanted to feel uncomfortable. I wanted to feel this kind of almost confront what this five years had been and sit in these spaces with these married men and take it and, and started to kind of take clandestine images like this one. He'd gone to the toilet, so I took a snap. And this was kind of one of the early images within the series. And as I was started to see these four different men at the beginning, I also was doing, trying to find my way with it. And, you know, when we are, we've gone through this kind of academic uh, education, we're like, you know, you read, you have this theory, you have a framework. And in Beyond the Pleasure Principle in Freud, like it's a big old book, tiny, tiny writing. But the, you know, the beauty as well of the creative process is, you know, you might read a chapter or you might skim read it and just look for inspiration. And in this text, there was this one particular sentence that changed the course of this project. And the sentence was, if you repeat something that's traumatic, it will become pleasurable. And I was like, what if I repeated seeing married men? Would I get ownership of this experience? Would it become pleasurable? And I was like, maybe that's what I'm doing. You know, it's all born in from psychoanalysis. I was like, maybe that's what I'm doing. So then I kind of had this, this framework to the series and I started to repeat seeing married men. And I also had to consider in what way did I want to shoot it? So I knew what I wanted to do, having had this kind of research process. And I decided 
through trial and error, you know, at the beginning I had a, a assistant outside the restaurant photographing me on dates. I had the waiter take pictures. I'd say, can you take a picture of us? But, you know, none of it worked, particularly the one through the window, too voyeuristic, too loaded already in a certain viewpoint. And actually accidentally one day, really randomly, <laughs> I was getting, I was down, you know, I was in the tube at Green Park in London. And as I was getting onto the tube, like a movie, the door opened and one of the married men came out and was like, oh, hi, how are you? And we went upstairs for a drink. And when I was having this drink, I, he was sitting there in his suit and we were in this very kind of posh place. And I was like, this is so weird. Um, I can't believe I bumped into one of these married men. I was only kind of seeing four at this point, like testing out whether it was interesting or not. And I happened to have a disposable camera in my bag just randomly. And I took a snap of him. And then I processed it and kind of forgot about it. When I processed it, it was perfect. The image was gritty, the image was grainy. The image really worked with the aesthetic that I wanted as though something wasn't seen. And just like that, I suddenly had the way I wanted to photograph the series, completely happy accident. So from that, I then had the framework and I started to repeat seeing these married men. And what I did was I actually dated 80 married men over an 18 month period. So I started to, you know, might see one for breakfast, I might see one for lunch and then a cocktail and then one for dinner. And it was only that one meeting. I realized that I didn't need to see them, you know, three or four or five times. It was just this idea of what is the institution of marriage looks like, looking like? Why are these men wanting to have an affair? What is the time like in this period of time where the internet you know, this internet is changing everything. So it was more of this kind of social documentary of this particular period, which could never be uncovered for, as a researcher. It could only ever really be uncovered as an artist putting yourself in this position. So this guy here was a, an estate agent and he was looking for something. And I would kind of, um, you know, I'd kind of had set things I wanted to ask them, but they never knew, they thought it was a date. This was one of the most interesting dates I went on. Um, we went to London Zoo <laughs> and he was um, the only man that I actually probably liked out of all 80. Incredible. And it's, there were 54 men in total. Um, and we went on 80 dates because the first few, as I said, I kind of did it as a research. And, you know, it's been really interesting, this particular image, because as this work has gone viral and it's been exhibited a lot, you know, people always like, <gasps> The way Natasha Caruana has captured the empty pram in the foreground, you know, it's, it's so loaded. But of course, it was a complete accident. I never even looked through the lens because I had to be very quick. They knew I was taking pictures, but I might just take one image per date, like snap, and that was it. Um, and it wasn't about them. It's not about them as individuals. So that's why you don't see any faces in the images another one here. And I just love this, the tabletops come like, become like theatres of the affair, the staging of the affair, you know, where we were, the phone, the cash, how they were paying, how this was like connecting, how we were working, how, how was this being negotiated? How is a potential affair being negotiated? And interestingly, of course, you know, this does bring up ethics. The fact that you know they are cheating on their family or wife or child but i'm cheating on them i'm coming and i'm making this work without them knowing you know what happens in that space and that's what i kind of give to the audience i give the audience these questions of who's in the right who's in the wrong what's happening and this is how it's presented so this was one of the first shows i did of the work and interestingly i you know i shot i finished the work you know two years prior but it was honestly so exhausting to do. And I was so still in, you know, I still had the men's conversations in my mind. I still was there living through it. I actually waited a while until I ever exhibited it, which I think is quite unusual to do. Often you shoot something and straight away you want it out in the world. But I wanted space between me and this work. So I have a large, a large tableau image made up of 54 photographs, which represent each of the men that I saw. And then I also have four larger images um, and everything is hand printed by me. So it's all shot on 35 mil film 
And then these are hand printed in the dark room, which again was another layer of this performance. Like if you print in the dark room, the color dark room is in complete darkness and handling paper that's like one and a half meters and printing, it, it's, it's very difficult to do. It's challenging to do, you know, on these large, in, and on these really large enlargers. And in the middle of the space, yeah, yeah. I've got a, I've got a uh, few sure. questions. This is incredibly interesting. The um, those those images are really beautifully ambiguous. I think so because they, you know, you you mentioned the pram, the mm -hmm. um, that by the viewer almost gets hypercharged with meaning, right? But then on the other side, you're saying <clears throat> that you're actually not looking through the viewfinder. I don't know if that camera actually has a viewfinder. Yeah? Could I yeah. ask, like, how many how many pictures do you take? Per date and how would you describe the actual editing that means like the selection process mm -hmm. I assume that in a few images like the the, the the man the married man is maybe visible or recognizable sometimes not I mean what does recognize actually mean you know like yeah. you know maybe if the wife would actually kind of see maybe just the arm maybe that would already be enough yeah how would you describe the process after you have taken the image yeah well, interestingly, you know, I only ever took a maximum, probably the maximum time I took images was on that particular day in the zoo, because that was the only time the date was touristic. Normally I was like in a bar or a restaurant. So I'd actually only take one, like one image. So the selection process was incredibly easy. Um, and you notice that towards the end when I got a bit, I don't know, a bit kind of right, I know what this is now. Um, you know, I might get a bit cocky and I take two or three. And there was only one time that I took three images and actually it was wrong, they felt really uncomfortable because it wasn't about the images. You know, sometimes there were a few dates I went on and I didn't take a single image because they were so nervous and it didn't work. And you know, you have to remember the hours that went into this work. You know, if you've ever talked to anyone online, you know, before it was like chat rooms. In the chat rooms you talk and then you might eventually get a phone number you get the phone number, you talk, on, you talk, and then eventually you meet up. So actually, you know, I spoke to thousands and thousands of men to get to the point of meeting them. And then you meet them and then maybe they're too nervous and you don't take any images. It's like so many hours go into that process. But I would never, it really was never in my intention to uncover any identities. And that's why I waited a while to show it. I didn't want a wife coming in and being like, that's my husband's jumper. Um, you know, that wasn't part of the conversation for me. So this is, you know, this is like pre-digital. I'm not there snap happy. I'm not there on my phone. It's like one quick photograph, which is like, oh, isn't that beautiful? There's a rose, done. And that would be my one image for the night. And, you know, because it's, because it's, quite, you know, it's because it's um, very, I suppose, artistic in, in its process. It means that if it didn't come out or if it was half blank, it didn't matter. Cool. So here is another, um, I, you know, as I said, I'm going to talk a bit about exhibiting. So I think that's quite interesting as a different perspective for you. Um, so this is here, the Northern Gallery of Contemporary Art. Um, and this was a really key exhibition to the start of my career where I was showing a, alongside Goya and Constable, some amazing names in this show. And this was all from, I showed work in progress of this and somebody got in touch with me from just picking up a postcard. The curator picked up a postcard and he's been an amazing supporter of my whole career. Um, you know, it's a really interesting lesson to keep in touch with people. So this was the, you know, a curator approached me to do a show in the um, ICP, Institute of Contemporary Photography in New York. So it was a solo show in their project space and the curator there, you know, the space was, you, you know, it kind of got used. So it wasn't kind of so much a gallery space, it was a project space. And we weren't allowed to use sound, which is shown with this work. So this was kind of her testing out and sending me images. And this is what the show looked like in the end. So this was in ICP in New York, where I actually had text of what the men said to me. And, and that was a really interesting part of the project. If you notice that there's this red purse here, I actually started to record what the men said to me. But that was because I did it as kind of a safety blanket, I suppose. I thought if anything happened, at least it's recorded. I don't know why I thought this, um, but the sound became an interesting element to the work. 
And so what I'm going to do is because this is recorded, Oops. I'm only going to show um, and I'm going to just pause it because uh, what happens is with this sound is, oh, amazing. I actually stopped it on our lead image here. <laughs> um, I actually recorded the men on these dates and the work, the sound of the men was never meant to be part of the work. It became a conversation through the curator where I said, well, I've got this sound. Um, and he was so fascinated by it that I had had these recordings, I've got these transcripts. But for me, it was a real challenge to think whether I wanted to include the sound or not. You know, it kind of changes the project quite a lot because you can make the audience think anything. Do I make the audience think I'm really beautiful and sexy? Do I make the audience think that the wife's horrible? I could edit anything together. I could edit all the bits where the men says, I'm so unhappy at home. You know, I could change anything. So what I did was I used the last, you know, 10 seconds of us saying goodbye. It meant that we were outside on the street. It was like a summary of the date. You couldn't quite hear, you couldn't quite hear their voice. You heard more of the background. So it became more, it became more of this, you know, something to help you have an imagination of what was happening. And then I kind of asked two questions, like, what are your intentions with me? And, you know, why are you looking for something else? So it became a summary. So I'm just going to play you like just a tiny little fragment of um, one of the clips. I think it was about here. Okay, great. Uh, that'd be really cool. Yeah. Um, if you wanted a more sexual kind of relationship, yeah. then I'd certainly be up for that. So I think okay. you'd be fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. So. <laughs> you. And is that that's your hotel? Is that hard to hear? I think it's all right. Really, it's uh, yeah. You get the sense. You get the sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, can show you a couple of. Uh, yeah. I can tell I that. That, those, that those recordings, I mean, they give it an incredible sense of there's something very intimate and something very organic about this, even about this kind of rustling sound, even the, the fact that those voices are slightly distorted. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it gives it a completely, as you said, a completely new dimension, I think. And it's yeah. really interesting, like which part you've actually selected mm -hmm. to represent this dating. Yeah, and when you're in the gallery space, you just hear the odd word. So you're standing in front of all of those images and you hear the words, you know, you might hear prostitute or love my wife and you might just capture little things. This was actually the image that I was talking about that was the mistake. This was the first image I ever took on a disposable camera. He, he got off the tube and I just, you know, shot this, this image. Well, not quite on the train, I'm at Euston Station. That's so romantic. What's gone wrong? Um, why, why are you trying to look for something else? That's such a shame. A bit of kind of... So you get the sense, but you know, within the process, it's really, it's really interesting to me that I've, this has never been played online. It's only ever played in the gallery space. So, you know, if I'm doing an artist talk, I ask them to not record this section because I love that it's just live in that moment. And also, you know, I do need to keep hold of, you know, some of my ethics. Like, I'm not interested in putting this online and existing a lot. And, it, you know, the way that the world is changing, it's, it, it's quite an interesting thing that how you keep it offline. If I'm doing an artist talk in a space, I ask people to not put their phones on and record it or even do a story on Instagram. So, yeah, if you want to hear the whole thing, you're going to have to see an exhibition. <laughs> um, so this is one of the works it's shown in Photofusion. And... Here you can see the inclusion of, and I'm going to show you a close up of this, of a red purse that sits alongside it. Because, you know, as this work started to get shown and people start to become really interested in this, and, you know, so many questions and trolling, and I realized I needed a full stop. I needed something that kind of said, this is the end of the work. You know, often some people might make a book or, you know, I think you need a full stop with a piece of work like this. So what I did was I decided to shoot the purse that had been my, my sidekick, essentially, been on every date with me. Um, and that, that sat alongside these images. You know, it's a very beautiful, lush image, really highly glossy, kind of really interesting that it sits alongside something really gritty and grainy. And you can see here this, this microphone that's in there. And, you know, it's just like this little oyster in this purse. And that was really, you know, I just wanted to have this monument to this purse that had been with me on all of these dates. Great, I'm going to just quickly flick through some other, other works in terms of where this has been shown. 
So, you know, I do love that it can move to different countries. I love that it can become a cultural conversation of, you know, if I show this in France, it's very different conversation. You know, they talk about the crimes of passion and to me showing this in China and in China, them talking, when I showed it on this particular exhibition, talking more about how I was the most shittest photographer ever. <laughs> like the images aren't very good. Um, you know, and I just, I just love it. You know, I love that that's what happens with this work. And then I did go on to create a book of this with transcriptions of what the, the men had said to me, um, which was a book with Here Press. And this is kind of the first page alongside one of the only images of a man wearing a wedding ring, because you know, the, 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 the men would take their wedding rings off to be on the dates with me. And I wanted to jump in here <laughs> um, because I'm gonna do this throughout the talk is between the series, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I make it work and how I do it. Um, and you know, for this idea of making work and my practice, I decided quite early on, you know, I did do some commercial shoots and such early on in my career, but it just never really worked. And I realized that I needed a space to make work. So just as I graduated, I did set up an art studio and I kind of wanted to talk a bit about this because right now we are in a downturn or a potential downturn where spaces are becoming available. And what happened is in 2008, there was a financial crash, okay? You know, that's what happened. A lot of businesses went under, there was a lot of space that was empty. And I actually took on a disused space in Clapham in South London. And it was a space that was completely, you know, derelict and like, well, you can see it. <laughs> and I decided that I, I, I wanted to create this space where artists would come together, different disciplines, not just photographers, because I know how to take a picture. Um, I wanted, you know, filmmakers or animators or um, graphic designers to come. And slowly, you know, I set this up, I co-founded this with an artist called Afshin Dekordi, and we made this space. And this was kind of what it looked like. There was like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There were seven studios. And, you know, it was a really amazing time in my career to have, to actually found something, you know, to be a founder suddenly meant that I could talk about my work without it being about my work. I could talk about something else. And, you know, it was a really integral element of me starting to get known within my career is making it not about me, making it about space for people to come together. And um, so here is, you know, how this is looking. And I think I've got an after image. So then it became like this, you know, quite underneath the pub, we were on the top floor. The middle floor was this big space where we had screenings. And then down below was a pub. So it was really, really amazing because whenever you did events, you had a bar ready stopped and people to clear up and it worked really well for the pub and for the artists above, you know, and for four years, it was such a great synergy between actually wanting to just get on with stuff, doing things DIY whilst having cheaper space to make work. Um, and that's, it's been quite a good process that because of this, I had, you know, an annual, open studio, I had deadlines, I had to make work because otherwise I'd have nothing to show. So it wasn't like early on I had funding or any of those things. I just gave myself these deadlines of like, I need to get on because I don't wanna be the only one with a bad setup or a bad studio. And then the other thing that I've done, I suppose as a trans, kind of a translation of Studio Strike, because what happens is of course, the economy picks up, you've now made the space beautiful. They think, oh, I want that space back. So the landlord's like, oh, I can rent that as offices now. You've made it all nice. What often happens with artists, of course, we got kicked out. I split up with the person I was doing it with. And so it's become dormant essentially. But I learned so much in that time and I learned the importance of community. And then two years ago, well, not quite two years ago, I set up Work Show Grow. And this was really set up because I am really passionate about talking about how things work. You know, I think, you know, within the art world, it's very much smokes and mirrors. Like, how do you get a gallery? How do you charge for things? Like, how does it work? And so that I didn't, wasn't doing all of this on my Natasha Caruana page, like my artist position, I created Workshop Grow, which is like workshops, how to get things done, you know, and it's been amazing over lockdown to bring a community together through lives, through workshops, through artist talks, as I'm sure it's been doing for your, your school as well. 
So we've done work with Photo Fringe. We've done, um, I was a partner guest school with Circulation in Paris. And it, you know, it, it is honestly just been such a great space for bringing together an international community and having diverse voices. So bringing voices to the photography platform that aren't otherwise often given that position. You know, right now we're in a really, you know, a really important time around decolonizing the lens and who should be photographing, who's given a platform. And to create these spaces means that you're able to elevate other voices. And that's something that I'm really passionate about within photography because, you know, it is very white male dominant space. I mean, that is the truth. It's like in the data. So, you know, I think each of us have a space to, you know, we, we've kind of got a responsibility to see you know, what are you doing to elevate other voices? So this is our, um, I wanted to show you this because we have a lot of IGTVs on our work show grow. So we've got these kind of like snippets of how to get ahead, like how to network, how to send an email. <laughs> how do you send an email to an agent? You know, it's really how to. Um, and this is kind of born from, you know, I work as a lecturer in, in um, London College of Communication. And, you know, even in that education space, that academic space, it's like, I just want to give people the nuts and bolts. So do check it out. We're going through a trans, we're going through a um, moment of change right now where we're thinking about actually offering more international crits and becoming more of a school, which is gonna be really exciting for the autumn this year. Okay, they're like little ad breaks, aren't they? <laughs> But I didn't really think of it like that. I just thought I wanted to break it up to talk about how things are done. So found something like, don't be scared. You know, we took out that space and a year later, we decided to call it a studio. We didn't make the whole concept and then be like, okay, we're gonna go and find space. We found space. And then after a year, we had a one year birthday and said, we're now Studio Strike. Like we just did it as we went. And actually this piece of work I made during that time because I was so broke. I had no money at all. I couldn't have, couldn't, you know, I didn't even have a camera. I couldn't afford film. And, you know, when you have those challenges, I think they're really interesting time because it forces you to think differently. So what I did was I actually used appropriated imagery. So I used found imagery rather than me shoot images. And I noticed that when women were selling their wedding dresses online, they were masking out their faces. And I was like, why, why is this happening in adverts? Like, why are these individuals masking their faces to sell their wedding dress. And it became this really weird thing that I noticed. And so for example here, the reason that I noticed was because the text was always like a beautiful bride or be a princess bride. But then the image was really like weird and eerie and kind of like robotic because you couldn't see the face. And so I was interested in this juxtaposition between the text being beautiful and then the image being something quite barbaric like cut out or scratched out. And so I started to collect these little images on my desktop and thinking like, oh, this could be interesting. You know, you might have those collections of weird things. And um, this was like my collection. And it slowly became a series because fascinatingly for me, I was like, when, you, when the bride is masking out their face, you start to notice different things about the images. You start to notice how they're standing, the flowers, you know, essentially kind of the pressure of being this bride. And, and I started to also notice like all the places that you feel represent everlasting happiness. If you want to signify the happiest day of your life, where do you stand? Where are normal people constructing these stories? Like it becomes a construction, it becomes a performance. So it became a whole series of the performance of the wedding day, which I didn't shoot, I didn't touch. It's this image of you know, the photographer, the photographer would then give it to the bride, the bride would appropriate it and they would send it to me. Um, and this kind of was all happening around the time of Kate and Will's wedding. There was a real shift in the way that the wedding dresses were used. So previously, you know, the wedding dress would be something very, you know, it would be an heirloom. The wedding dress would be kept for years and it would become the christening gown of the firstborn. But in this time of the internet, of Facebook and Instagram, suddenly people wanted to spend so much money on their wedding day. And all they needed to do was get the photos. And then this dress was like a prop. Suddenly the dress would become reused and, and shared, whereas previously it was always be kept. 
And it became, you know, this performance, this prop. And it became a lot around this language of you can be a princess too. You know, the princess is getting married. And suddenly people started spending a lot and a lot of money on their wedding day. And the work is really the kind of anthropological study of what was happening at that time. And the most weird thing come out, like, where is his shoes? Like, what is he doing in this image? Like, and she's standing there so bold in the foreground. And to get these images, and where is he going with his suitcase? <laughs> And to get these images, I at first contacted the brides on Gumtree and said, hi, I'm an artist. Why are you blocking out your face? But of course the women would be like, you're weirdo, stop wasting my time, if they even replied at all. So then I decided I had to become a bride. So I became a bride and pretended like I wanted to buy their dress. And I'd say to them, you know, can you send me a high resolution image so I can zoom in to see the details of the skirt or the ruffles or the lace. And suddenly these women were sending me high resolution images of the, the, the photographer had shot. And I was like, this is crazy. You know, so it became this really, I became like part of the club where they completely trusted me. And they'd say like, oh, congratulations on your wedding. How exciting. And like, it was almost as though everything went out the window of the way that people negotiate online. So what I did was I started to collect these images and I collected 122 together. And some were very sad, like this image here, you know, this very delicate folded tissue placed over her face. You know, did he die? Did they get divorced? Why is she selling her dress? Why is this such a tender anonymizing of her face? And this is one of my favorites actually. I really feel the pressure of the bride. You the hunched shoulders, the weeping willow, I mean, it's so loaded, this photograph. Um, and it's, it's almost hard to imagine that she's even smiling behind there, <laughs> behind that frame, behind that face. And so the collection is, is of such. Again, some are quite comical. You know, it also talks about, you know, it talks about ownership of images, but it also talks about the way people anonymize their faces online, or even technically, the technical abilities of being able to anonymize your own face. So this is how I first showed it. I showed it just with little small postcard images, which kind of mirrored the idea of a six by four, something that you would put on your mantelpiece at home. And actually these are the images that I wanted. Sometimes the brides would then be very interested that I wanted to buy their dress and they would say, oh, and they put their dress on and take pictures of in their homes with their dress. And I was like, oh, that's not the image I want. I wanted the trophy image. I wanted the image that was on the mantelpiece. And they were the images that I wanted. And I've shown it in different ways. So again, here, like a real scattered image where people kind of walk along um, the series. I'm gonna, and this here was, you know, research is really important to my practice. I do write as well, like writing about the use of the image, writing about the research that goes behind the image. You know, such as, such as this, it's like, it's so interesting that photography you know, it's social studies. This is a typology of how people were selling their wedding dresses at this particular time. And historically, I think it becomes really interesting. And I also feel like as time's gone on, the work's become more politicized because of this pressure to perform, this pressure for perfection, this pressure to spend too much money on your dress, like for one day. I mean, the prices now of weddings are crazy. It's like, you know, where does this come from? So I like to discuss that. Do you know, um, did you find out eventually why um, the, uh, the women actually covered their, their, their faces? Because you would assume that in the, in the digital era, those images are probably available or, you know, mm. online, maybe on their Facebook profile, maybe on their Instagram page. Um, why did they make this decision to cover their faces when they then eventually sold it? Yeah, I mean, I did actually, with that work, it's really hard to know where to stop. Like, do I go to the houses and buy the dress with a camera? Do I perform that? Do I do a secret thing? Where do I stop? So I actually stopped by emailing them last time saying, call me superstitious, but why are you selling your wedding dress? And I'd ask them that question and they would, you know, they'd send me a whole, you know, all these reasons. And often it talked about how they were in debt or too fat, 
or storage issues. And so I have a whole, I present it with a text tag cloud of the reasons that they gave me. And I never ask them explicitly, like, why you, why have you masked your face? But you can kind of determine from the reasons, like particularly the divorce ones, there's a definite parallel between divorce and the face is actually being cut out, something more aggressive with the image. And, you know, that's really interesting as well. So I never ask them exactly, but I do kind of stipulate, I suppose, within the work. Yeah, it's really interesting how this links to the to the marriage man. You know, we already talked about the uh, the um, ambiguity of the images mm -hmm. that you allow the viewer to interpret them in different ways. So, um, by asking those those questions, you never one hundred percent precisely actually answer them. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting parallel. I think between those those two projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that kind of you know that slippage of being undercover and being able to kind of that gray area, I just I, I just find that such an interesting place to make work where you're interrogating things from a different perspective. And then what happened is, you know, I, I, I started to get noticed for this work that I was making and never really through lots of competitions or open calls. It kind of became through me being part of the community, setting something up, wanting to share things, share knowledge. And then I was nominated and won this BMW award, Art and Culture Award, which was quite a big deal. It meant that I went to live in a museum in France for three months. I had a full-time assistant to help me. I had a solo show in Arles, which is the main photography festival in international, I think. One of the oldest and main photography. It's kind of what we think of as Cannes for filmmakers. Arles is for photographers. And I had a book, I had a documentary made, you know, and I, and I received money and I received a BMW to use during the residency. So there's quite a lot of pressure, to be honest, as an emerging artist to suddenly be like put on this pedestal and be like, make work, off you go, there you go, have this stuff. And I decided to do a piece of work that talked about at first sight, which looked at love at first sight, because I kind of enjoyed the fact that love at first sight, even love, is something that you can't see really and I love this kind of impossibility of photographing that something that's invisible and I thought that was a good place to start and what happened is I actually walked into a bar and I walked into a bar and I saw this man and I had love at first sight and you've seen my two previous bodies of work I don't particularly believe in love I think it's a fiction I think it's something that's commercialized but there was me it was happening to me walked into a bar and six months later I got married to somebody I never even lived with I never even lived with him you know it wasn't something on on someone on paper that I thought I would be with you know he was he had a previous wife he had two kids but you know something drew me to do this to do this marriage and you know the day before the wedding or like two three days before the wedding I suddenly freaked out and I thought, and I go to where I always go when I need some headspace. I go to the British Library. I find that space amazing. You know, you can't have a phone. It's quiet. You can only write in pencil. And I started to study and look at why the fuck am I doing this? Like, why am I being drawn to this person in such a short amount of time, willing to put everything aside? And what is happening to my brain? What is the chemical reaction that's making me do this? And I started to study love at first sight, not, really, not for a project, just because I needed to know it was okay for me to walk down the aisle in 48 hours time. And also to get away from my mum, who's like, when are you having your spray tan and your hair? And there's a certain order to do things. I'm like, just leave me alone. Um, so this was my desk, but I did get married. I, I did it, you know, as you saw, <laughs> I, I did the studying and I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna go for it. And I actually got married in a group wedding, actually. There was 10 people getting married at once. And, you know, it was an amazing moment where it was the time in 2014 where in the UK, anybody could marry anybody. It didn't matter about your gender and or your sexual orientation. Like, I just felt like that was a beautiful moment where it was about love rather than about this idea of what love is and who can marry who. So I thought, yeah, you know, so I got married with loads of guys on guys and women on women. And we were like this heterosexual couple and it was so much fun. But the, the thing is the next day I had to get up and I had to move to France. I didn't ever move in with my husband and I had to go and do this residency. And so I suppose I put myself in a bit of a tight 
situation of getting married and then moving to France straight away. But the morning after the wedding, you know, you've got to start somewhere with projects. And I'm going to show you a bit of the process with this work. And I had to, I had to start. I knew that I was kind of leaving him behind. And I got up and I took these two photographs and I forced myself to, to shoot as a starting point. So these are never shown. This is just like the starting point of the work. But I went on to really think about this, this movement and this action of what happens when someone experiences love at first sight. You know, what is this idea of, you know, coup de foudre, coup de foudre in French means the lightning strike. And I was like, you know, this strike of energy, the strike of something that comes out of clouds and darkness. And I kind of just shot around it for a bit, not really knowing what I want to do with the project. But then as I found my way, I decided that I wanted to re, re I suppose, re-perform and kind of replay this role play of imagining what it was like to feel this love at first sight. And so I started to, in this town, chalon sur saone in Burgundy in France, I started to find these places that I wanted to shoot. And of course, Simon, my husband, did come and visit me for one weekend during the residency, and we, we shot this this kind of trial and error of this flash, like this lightning flash. And they're always first thing in the morning, these images, because I was so interested that the morning that I woke up and walked into that bar, I had no idea that my life would change. And I loved that first thing in the morning, this idea of impossibility or possibility that you don't know what's gonna happen. So in a way, this is quite, the most photographic I have shot, the fact that I was in the Museum of Photography, the birthplace of photography, Nice for Nieps Museum. Like in, in, in Europe, they believe that Nieps was the inventor of photography. In the UK, it's obviously Fox Talbot. And so I was there in this like birthplace of photography and I did get quite photographic, to be honest. I kind of felt like I had to, I was quite early on in my career, you know, and I had like BMW machine <laughs> being like, what are you gonna shoot? But I went round and I asked people, you know, quelle experience coup de foudre? Have you experienced love at first sight? And I tried to find people in the town that I could work with. Um, so some of them, you know, some of them were very interesting. You know, this was two girls that had never had a relationship with girls before and they saw each other and they fell in love at first sight. And one of them, and I used elements of the story when I interviewed them and slowly would make the image very collaboratively, like we shot this four times to get to the particular image that we wanted. And this couple here, like, it's such an interesting, crazy story. It was so theatrical, this idea of a horse running into a house. And, you know, this woman was on a horse and she, it reared and went into the home of this man and he had love at first sight. Like really, really interesting. So I love this theatrical story. So I used that with the trees I used that with, within the elements of the story when I shot it. And alongside, I didn't want it to just be, like you've seen a bit of my work, I love to question things. I didn't want it to just be this like beautiful, like romantic story of love at first sight. I wanted the counter argument of science. It's like, what is science saying about this? Is science saying it's true or not? So I did a lot of investigations into scientific experiments where scientists have tried to uncover the truth. And that was really interesting to me to present both sides of the story as the project. And so this is some of my, my notebooks of the time, like this experiment here, Love in 90 Minutes, where you know um, Arthur Aaron looked at how two people can fall in love. Like, can you ask yourselves questions of each other to strangers? Can you create intimacy? This other experiment, which was one of the first experiments of love, where they decided that love was a different emotion than lo just liking someone a lot. Love through anxiety, it was in 1974, where on a suspension bridge, somebody asked them questions on a suspension bridge and a normal bridge. And I love this, when I read this, I was like, oh my gosh, high anxiety. Maybe that was why I had love at first sight myself because I was anxious. I was walking to a bar the first time going out in like you know six months, I'd had this big breakup and my family forced me to go out to this freaking bar. I was like, I'm not leaving the house. So as I walked into the bar, I was stressed out and I saw him and I was like, is that why this has happened? So that was kind of my first experiment where I thought there was something I could do with this. And these are some of the other experiments. And so this is the starting point and I'm gonna show you the process. 
I start with my sketchbook, I start writing out my research, and I start kind of doing these little drawings, like imagining what it could look like. And so one of the experiments where a scientist put numbers on his students' heads to work out how people pair up. And also there is a bit of comedy here, like how can a scientist put numbers on a student head and it gives you the answers of love? I mean, what? <laughs> um, so this was me and this is my technician, Sebastian. So this was the studio that I had to shoot. So behind there is, you know, the, the, um, the colorama and me shooting. And then just next to it is my studio, so my office. So it was an amazing space at the top of this museum. And we, I wanted to see what it would look like with these students putting numbers on their heads so to kind of recreate these images, to recreate some of the experiments. And also I read so many PhD papers on love. There's no pictures. I was like, where are the photographs? <laughs> so I wanted to include these photographs and remake these photographs. So this is like number one shot on my iPhone. And then from this, I would then, I then started to work with some students, drama students that the museum found for me. So with these drama students, I started to work with this pairing where, you know, if they had a high number, they would try and pair up with another high number, but they didn't know their own number. And it was all about the value of the person. But again, this is really badly shot. It's kind of a mistake. It doesn't really work. And I decided to do another shoot where I used color. Um, so here is another shoot with color. Again, it's not, it's not good photography, Institute of Photography, is it? Like, I'm sure you can tell me what's going wrong here. Um, but, you know, this is part of my process, slowly finding what I need as I'm doing it. Like, I, it's kind of like a sketch, I suppose. And then, you know, happy accidents, things happen where I was driving in this beautiful BMW and I was driving along the street looking for locations and I saw outside this college, people in white coats smoking. And I literally stopped the car and I ran over and I was like, white coats, clinical scientists, this is what I need. Why did I not think of this? So then I started to work with these science students and started to use the data. So this was kind of the one, this is an early image like where it's not retouched or put together or printed and scanned. And suddenly the work translated into a different, you know, it kind of fitted with the context of what I was talking about. So this was the, one of the final images here where you get numbers on their heads and it is paired with like this idea of how people pair up. So in the exhibition, I include the notes and the scientists found that, you know, early on people with high numbers, people that felt like they were desirable, they knew they were desirable, they pair up really quickly and with correlating numbers so like 30 would pair up with 28. And then the scientists found that there's this moment of like, oh, what happens now? They're all pairing up. And then there's this moment of panic where people just start pairing up with anyone, anyone that's left. And I thought that was really funny because those who remain ultimately settle for each other. <laughs> and I just thought I kind of liked the reasons and the questions and the pairing phenomenon. So I decided to kind of include the experiments as part of the project. So this is what it looked like. This was it in Parry Photo where I had the seven experiments and underneath I had this like data on, on um, tracing paper. So really kind of ephemeral, beautifully presented, very much like data or science and put them together. And then underneath was a little description in English and in French. And then I've got one more other install shot here so you can kind of see them. And again, you know, I was had a really good funding for this. So I had beautiful prints. I worked with individually with a printer, with a framer, you know, a big solar show in the middle of the Grand Palais. It was an amazing moment um, for, for that piece of work. So from that piece of work, you know, I suppose I had a bit of difficulty because, you know, you work so hard for your work. You work so hard trying to make ends meet and to have money to shoot. And suddenly you're like put on this pedestal and suddenly people want to work with you. You're talking about you. They are writing about your work. They're buying your work. I decided that from that point, I wanted to start giving back. So I actually moved on to start up a mentorship. Oh, I was gonna show you a bit of the video actually. Let me just move, I've got a bit of the video. They made this video. They made, they made a doc, they had a documentary filmmaker that came to France to shoot, that came to the town to shoot me. And I'm gonna show you a snip of me making work. Um, 
if I can just get this 220. Okay, so this is my flat that they gave me. And I'm just going to show you just a little snippet. There's one shoot that I was trying to do uh, with the person that I met at the Vendange. They've been married for 30 years. And this is how they met. They were in Givray and the, the woman was scared of horses. And she was sitting in this building at someone's home. But I imagine it was quite a big home. Because yeah. suddenly a horse came into the front room. <laughs> and then this man followed and sa saved her. And then the man had coup de foudre. And then they got married. <laughs> yeah. oh, and they've got two beautiful girls. Yeah, really nice. Okay. We have to prepare the picture. Okay, so you can uh, maybe look at each other. And you just uh, lean back a bit. Oh, yeah. Oui, perfect. And then looking at uh, your Comme money. Ça? Oui, oui, oui. Douce. Oui, oui, oui. Okay. Perfect. J'adore, j'adore. What I wanted to do was recreate that moment where she said, yes, I'm going to be with you. And I used the trees here to really create this dramatic kind of sense of this dramatic sense of theatre, theatre of love. I like the way that you can kind of just pull from these elements of the story that I was told um, to create the photograph. Great. So I haven't seen that in a while, actually. <laughs> um, I just thought I would want to see the process. But, you know, that was me kind of like warming up. I always do this stupid little dance. I don't know why I do it. I have to stand on a step because I'm quite short. And I'm shooting with a Mimia RZ and just with a single flash gun. And that's, you know, I just love that when you see the image and people like go, oh, that image is so romantic. But actually, in fact, there's a freaking main road behind me. Cars are going past, honking, like, what are you doing? And when you have the image, all of that is forgotten. <laughs> it's like, it just becomes that moment. And I just, you know, it's one of those magics of magic of photography, isn't it? That you can present any image to the audience. So as I was saying, actually, this idea of giving back. So from that and from all of that profiling that happened, I decided to keep a little bit of money back. And from 2015, actually, I 2016, 2015, for five years, I've been running this NC mentorship where I have, you know, two or maybe four emerging female photographers, identifying female photographers that work with me. This particular year you're seeing, which was two years ago, 2018, I actually had and rented a house in, front, in, in London for four people to come, four emerging photographers, and we worked really intensely for a week. And right now, I am also working with two people for 2020, and I've been kind of sharing it on Instagram and such. And, you know, it's really important, I think, as your career progresses and as people want to give you money, that you keep a little bit back and think, what can you do with it? Because you have to, as I said, like, you have to elevate those voices. So that's been a really fun element um, to the practice. And also I see myself as a digital, digital mentor. You know, I share what I'm doing. I, you know, I share daily on Instagram stories. If I'm, you know, if I'm doing a print, if I'm deciding what frame and such, I share the process because I don't think you are, you're often seeing that inside perspective of how it works. Right, I've got about 15 minutes. So I'm going to show you a couple of works here, which I'm gonna just slightly talk about. I'm not gonna go as in depth as I have talked about the other series, because as I said, I wanted to show you this journey that I've been on with photography. And, you know, this here, what happened is, as I mentioned, like obviously this profiling that happened to me with that award, suddenly people wanted to commission me and work with me. And this was a series which was commissioned by the Open Data Institute, which is it's in London and it's been set up by Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, is the inventor of the World Wide Web. He created the World Wide Web. And he wanted to commission artists as an artist in residence because he believes that artists are the original code breakers. Like it was kind of a crazy tweet that I got given in the DMs of me being invited to be interviewed for this. And it was all because I was sort of sharing my work as I was doing it. And I was sharing the data from that love project. <laughs> and so it was like interesting for him and for the Institute to see you know, a female artist working with data that wasn't like war or gunfare or anything heavy. It was like love. So they commissioned me to make a piece of work and then decided to make a piece of work around divorce and the reasons why people get divorced. Everyone was like, oh my God, you're getting divorced. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I'm preparing, but I know everything about divorce. Um, so that was quite interesting. A lot of people thought, you know, oh, the marriage was just a performance then. I was like, no, no, no. 
So I actually returned to the fairy tale for sale image because it was really, it, I noticed that I was living in this tech company, you know, for a year. I was embedded in this tech company and I started to, I had to make work about data. That was the premise of the piece of work. So I had to use open data. You know, it's like, how do I do that? I know nothing about data, but I, I overheard a conversation in the, in the canteen, like these cool tech companies where everything's free and there's bean bags and there's like vending machines, free lunches. And there was this woman that was getting married and she was talking about where she wanted to get married. And she said, um, one of the workers there, she said, I'm going to get married in Barbados. I want the sea, I want the beach. And one of the co-workers said, but you know, statistically, the seaside has the highest rates of divorce. You don't want to be photographed next to the sea. Statistically, it's actually the worst place you can be photographed. And I was just like, whoa, I've done fairy tale for sale. I know how many women position themselves next to the sea as this fiction of perfection. So I said to this person, like, let's have a meeting. I looked at all the data and I was like, wow, the hot spots of divorce, the top 10, not just like a few, number one to number 10, every single town in the top 10 of divorces is a coastal town. I was like, this is crazy. Why do people want to be photographed at sea? And at the same time, literally in the same day, my friend posted this image on Facebook. And I was like, this is nuts. It's true. Everyone's doing it. So I decided to investigate this idea of, you know, what this illusion is and this fantasy of the seaside, but actually how data tells a very different story. And that was the start of the project, essentially. So I'm going to kind of flick through quite quickly. Again, sketchbooks, research. I decided to do a road trip. I went to the 10 towns of divorce. Originally, I wanted to shoot a documentary film. And I thought, you know, I'm going to photograph and I'm going to film why people are getting divorced. I'm going to interview people. I was staying with married men. So I, I sorry, divorced men. I found on Airbnb men that just talked about I. And they talked about like their image was just them. And when I measured them, I'd say, oh, I'm doing a road trip about divorce. And they'd say, oh, I'm divorced. I'd be like, great, I'm staying with you. So I stayed with the divorced men. I immersed myself for three weeks in this road trip. I left my husband. I didn't see him through my first wedding anniversary because I was doing this road trip and staying with divorced men, investigating divorce. And this was my trip. Like it was quite an intense um, project. But you know, when I was on the journey, I realized like, who am I to go to these places which had you know, high deprivation and gambling and alcohol problems? Who was I to go to these places and be like, oh, look at your high divorce rates. It just didn't work. I just didn't like the images. So during that time, I realized the story had to be me and my husband. It had to be that we emulated the story rather than looking at others. So what happened at the end of the road trip, I came back and I met my husband with our wedding clothes on three weeks after I hadn't seen him. And we started to play with the gestures of divorce, like gambling, what would that look like? What would old age look like? And together we kind of, I shot this film, a five minute piece of emulating this struggle and negotiation that happens when you have these external forces. However much you love someone, where you live, there's external forces. And I thought that was so interesting that because of a postcode, it can change the way that your relationship exists because you know high, high waiting times on the NHS and hospitals can cause stress within a marriage. Lack of open spaces was one of the reasons. And I did all of this tabulation and looked at all of this open data. So this was asked, you know, again, it was the, the whole project was amazingly funded. The whole thing, which wasn't just my position, there was like 94,000 pounds funding, which meant that I could get people to help me work on it. Friends that would often do things for free, I could pay. So I had someone helping me with the choreography, helping me with the work. Um, and at the same time, I was collecting wedding rings. So I went to lots of different cash converters on these road trips. And I started to buy wedding rings that were discarded, wedding rings that had this story and I kind of wanted to have this performance of like walking through this curtain of broken dreams. You know, you, 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 the illusion is you buy a wedding ring and when it's on your finger, it's gonna be perfect, it's gonna be perfect. 
but yet there are all of these struggles that take place. So I had to learn jewelry. I had to work with, I worked with jewelry students. I had to learn about brass and making these little links and everything. It was an amazing project. Also that I could put the audience on a journey in the exhibition space. So this is what it looked like. I created a floating cinema and I worked with a um, exhibition designer. So this floating cinema at the back was the projection of the film, this five minute piece of me and my husband struggling in our, in our clothes, getting very dirty um, looking at this perfection of marriage. But for the audience to view the work, they had to walk through the curtain of broken dreams. And this is what the work looked like. So you walk through this curtain, you have this like chingling sound and you see this film of, you know, the tenderness, but then also, you know, this, this difficulty and this disruption that happens. So this work has gone on, you know, it's touring quite a lot actually, um, this series. And it was, a, it was a scary thing to move away from just photography. But I thought, you know, with, with the budget that I had, I just thought this is my time to test it out. And I think, you know, sometimes we always stay in, we feel like we have to stay in our lane. <laughs> you know, we have to stay in our medium, but you get so much out of trying new things. And, you know, I didn't know whether it would work or not, but I did it. And actually I'm, I'm quite happy with it. I didn't expect to feel like that within the work. But also I think it was a reaction from having to be so photographic with the at first sight work and being so purist with photography. I kind of felt like I needed to change things. Okay, so this is the last bit I'm gonna end on, which is talking about Timely Tale, where I actually, from that, actually, let me go back to that image, because this idea of floating and people immersing themselves, I found that so inspiring and it really made me think about 360 degree cameras and this idea of what would be the next step on this journey of immersion. And I was like, right, I'm gonna make a 360 degree film. <laughs> Never done it before, didn't know anything about it. And it was a commission for PhotoWorks. So I knew I was one of five people maybe to be approached for a series with them, a commission. And I kind of knew that they wanted people playing with new technology. So I thought new technology, uh, okay, right wrote the quick thing, did the interview, and I got the commission. Like, it was really, really great. Um, but I wanted to do it about kind of thinking about the ethics. Like, if you have a 360 camera, the camera records everything. I'm not the author of the work anymore. There's no power role between me and the subject. It's like the camera records everything. It's such an honest way of making work. And actually, when I made this work, I worked with my mother and I wanted to tell my mother's story. So this is my mother's bedroom. It's like she has physical and mental health issues. She has a kidney failure. She has dial dialysis three times a week. She did have a transplant, but it's failed. You know, the life is, it, you know, it's difficult for her. And I think we have this idea of what mental health looks like, what physical health looks like. But yet using a 360 camera, I could show what her, you know what, she still likes dating. She's on Tinder. She saves up her money and buys a piece of designer clothing from her benefit because it might make her go out. And I was able to show all of that rather than normally when we think of these images, you might think of these images. We go into a space and as photographers, we capture these images, but there's all these other stories on the fringes of the frame. And her room was so 360 window here, mirrors, clothes, like it was perfect. So I actually started to do little clips of her, just kind of getting used to the work, getting used to working with her in film. Also, I had a residency in LA just after this. So I only had a two week window to put the team together, to shoot the work, to make it. And then I had the summer to edit it because when I got back in September, the show opened in October. It was like, it just had to be done. Um, so this is probably the quickest piece of work I've ever made in terms of the shooting. So this was her, this was my mum, like, you know, on her dating apps because she wants to find Mr. Right. Mr. Right that could take her away from her situation. Like, you know, people still have these aspirations and yet we often don't depict it. Um, this is the 360 camera. Again, it was crazy to put a camera up and not be able to see what's being recorded you have to shut the door. Like I couldn't be in the room. <laughs> I just shut the door and let her do her thing. Like she woke up from a nap. 
and so this was me um, editing it afterwards, like without the team, without anyone there, I had to kind of figure out what it is I want to show. But whilst I was there, I was thinking very much about this physical and virtual space. Um, so I ended up doing a single take of the work. So it was just a five minute video of her waking up from a nap, taking her medication, trying to find something to wear, and just a, a little monologue of her talking about her life. It actually was very simple once you put your headset on and, and viewed this film. But what I did do is I wanted to use the physical space, this idea of when the audience comes in, we've all seen those headsets that sit in a little corner on a stool and sometimes they don't work or like how am I meant to watch this? I wanted to make a transformative space, a transitional space, this liminal space of physical and virtual. And I decided that I wanted to create a waiting room. I've been to so many waiting rooms with my mum and the waiting room was this place of public to go private. You know, when you're in these public spaces, you don't know who you're sitting next to. You don't know their story. And I was using technology to tell the story, essentially, of the person that could be sitting next to you in a hospital waiting room. And also the work talks about the crisis of the NHS, the fact that, you know, my mum... Now it's been four years, she's waiting to get on the waiting list. She's not even on the waiting list yet. And so many of these spaces are closing down. So I actually used disused furniture. So all the surgeries that have closed down in London, I started to you know, bribe caretakers. I started to phone them up, see if I could get some furniture. And I could only do this once I got back from the residency. So I had about a three week window Luckily, photo works were amazing. They didn't know what I was going to show because I didn't know what I was going to find. And I found all these items and I put them together in the exhibition. Um, so here you see us building the exhibition, building the waiting room. And this is where the work came from. This is like the sketches. This was, I had all these images on my phone of hospitals that I'd been with my mum. So I just recreated these hospital spaces into the exhibition space. You know, it was a it was an installation and I found the same items because there's the same thing that you see in all of these hospitals. So here again, you see like the, the signifiers and the, the little clues I took from real hospital waiting rooms and I put them into the installation space. Again here, you know, these toy, toys that you don't really want anyone to play with <laughs> that sit in doctor surgeries. I found all of this stuff and also it really smell of like doctor's surgery and hospitals. So when you put the headset on, it was such a dis, you know, it was such a discombobulating space to then get the headset out of my mum's bedroom and be in this waiting room. So here, and I did nods to the crisis of the services and the cuts at the time as well. So again, Technology, I had no idea. I watched so much YouTube to learn how to do this. I did work with someone that helped me with the app. Annoyingly, I didn't, I was the one that loaded all of these apps and got everything ready the night before the exhibition. I think that was my like big sleepless night. I've never, never done that since. I now make sure everything's loaded like days before. Um, so this is what it looked like. This is the headsets. And again, it's really interesting because people are in the headsets, but then you have the people watching the people in the headsets. So you have this exhibition of an exhibition and also around the whole exhibition was glass windows. So you also had people watching, passing the street because it was in a university. And I actually, I should have mentioned that I work a lot with public spaces. I don't work with, I've worked with commercial spaces, but I much prefer working with public spaces. Anybody can come in, you know, a man that is, you know, suffering from his own mental health that's going to the surgery next door to the hospital, to the university, they were popping in to see the show because they thought maybe it was a waiting room or doctors. It was like really interesting to work, to work in this way. Um, so there we go. So that's kind of how it looked. And also I did make this second space, which kind of happened quite accidentally. I did a test, I had amazing volunteers, which became minders of my mother's story. They help people get the headsets on and they've just made sure everyone was okay once they're there. We realized that people didn't want to leave. They listened to my mom's voice. They were like quite emotional about the story, but yet you need to get them out because people are waiting. <laughs> so 
amazingly photo work the day of the opening I turned up with my mother's dresser her chair her rug and it became a space that we could say you know if you just want to give me the headset if you want to go and sit in Penny's chair you can think about the work so they kind of got up and they were able to go and sit in this space and think about the work and that was a that was amazing um I don't know it was like such a genius thing to include because it meant that someone they had a place to go they moved out logistically and also they had the moment to think about what they'd seen. And she talks about collecting. She talks about collecting in the film, like collecting children and collecting teapots and never having enough money. So it was referred to in the film. So it worked really well. Great. I'm going to. Oh, yeah. And this was the image. I, sh I just reshowed this at the very end of the year at the time of the election because obviously the whole NHS again was like all being talked about. Now the narratives have changed even more because of COVID. And I took some portraits of my mum in her room just to update the story to be like, you know, she's still waiting. Like 2019, she's still waiting to even get on the waiting list. Great, shall I end there? Or shall I, what, how, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I think we probably need to come to an end soon. Yeah, um, that's fine. Yeah, so I would like to invite everyone who can, yeah, uh, to maybe ask any questions in the live chat box here on the right hand side. Remember, you need to log in. So I know that the sometimes um, this can, in fact, uh, can, can affect the, the live chat experience a little bit. But I've got some questions. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, um, the way that your work has developed over time? Um, the, can you spot a pattern that it become more complex? And I would also like to know the your MA at the RCA. Uh, what type of influence did it have in this artistic develop process? Um, I don't know. I think um, I suppose for me, like I got my crest. I got a crest on my forehead that said uh, that said I went there. Um, I had two years to feel bad about my work. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, I've always been a little bit negative about it. Um, I think I did it too early, essentially. I, I, I applied straight for my BA and I just didn't think I would get in. I was like really genuinely shocked when I got in. Um, but when I was there, it's changed a bit now, but when I was there, it was still very classic. Like a lot of people were shooting on 5.4 and there was a real inherent like use of theory. And I was shooting on playing with a disposable camera. I mean, can you imagine like turning up and playing with, with a disposable camera? It was so different. And for the final show, I just showed four married man images. That's all I showed. And so I showed work in progress. And that was quite controversial, I think, because the final show is such a big part of that MA. It's such a big part of the college's ethos, almost as though you only actually have a year and two months to make the work. And then it's all about the show. It's all about the delivery. And so I kind of went a little bit against the grain, I suppose, and just showed what I was happy with. And I always try and like, you don't, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to put the whole thing out. So I think, I suppose it did, it did show me a little bit more confidence in, I wanted to do things my way. I suppose that's what it gave me ultimately. Hmm, yeah. Do you think it's, uh, I mean, obviously, as you said, it's such a huge name. Do you think it, it opened a lot of doors afterwards? in terms of getting um, funding? You know, I never really talk about it. I think I've met tutors recently, actually. I was at an event and I, she was introducing me to someone and she said, oh, this is my ex-student. And the person, you know, is quite well known. He was like, oh, I never knew you went to the RCA. And she said, yeah, she never talks about it. So even the tutors know. I mean, it's just, um, I think, you know, some people write their name and put RCA, MA under behind their name whenever they write it. and. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, it, I mean, I have to be aware of my privilege. Like I have to be aware that it probably has opened doors for me. And also I got a free place, like I got a scholarship. So that, that I mean, that's amazing. I, you know, I couldn't, I wouldn't probably be where I am now because I was offered a free place there. Like that was quite extraordinary, but it was hard. Like I cannot lie, it was hard because my mum was in hospital for six months of it in intensive care, having a transplant in just, down the road at Guy's Hospital. So every day I was going to hospital. I was working, you know, two, three jobs. It was, whereas others had, they were sending their work to New York to be printed and they're sending their work to New York to be processed. It's like, that was part of my cohort. So it was quite difficult to be 
in that position where in one term, in one way you have all that privilege and you're like, wow, I'm here. But in the other way, you are scrabbling and trying to make it work. And you're thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, and I just had a lot of family troubles when I was there. And so it just made it hard. I see. Good. I think we're going to come to an end soon, uh, or actually now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Natasha. This was a really fantastic talk.